we discussed before how you were recruited for the Sea Org while you were in school and yeah. stuff like that. You never joined the Sea Org, but like, you did at one point join staff mm -hmm. in Tampa. Mm -hmm. So how did you get recruited for staff? What closed you? What made you make that decision? Two ultra dipshits, right? One was named Lynn Irons, and his claim to fame was spreading Scientology in Russia with the help of Bud Reichel. Bud Reichel won a Freedom Medal Award. Lynn Irons did not. The reason Len Irons did not is because his wife was dying of cancer here in the U.S. and he was cheating on her with an ex-KGB agent in Russia. But he has the balls to say that I'm an evil person, right? So he was the executive director of Tampa Org, okay? And then Tom Cummins, right? He owns like uh, energy rooms and stuff like that. And the fucked up thing is he walks around, you know, trying to spread do-gooders. That motherfucker in his early 20s trafficked cocaine, right? I'm talking that Trump. That one before folk. Scientology. Yeah, whatever. So I did cocaine after it Scientology. I think I'm more justified. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't sell it. I just consumed it. I stimulated the economy. He took jobs away from America. That piece of shit. Okay, but anyway, so, so Bud Reichel two, and Lynn Irons. No, 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 no. Lynn Irons here. and Tom Cummins. Oh. They, they, they closed me on joining staff because they say you're going to be such a great addition to the team. And they just blew up my ego, right? So at this point, were these guys executive director <laughs> of Day and Foundation, or were they both well, in one org? Lynn Irons was executive director of Foundation. Tom Cummins was the PES, the Public Executive Secretary. So he ran all the public outreach, basically. All right, so let me jump in real quick. So. The, the orgs, some orgs are divided up into two separate orgs. There's the day org, Monday through Friday, 9 to 6, and the foundation org, Monday through Friday, 7 to 10, and then Saturday and Sunday. So foundation is essentially the night and weekend shift. Okay, so you're saying one of I these got, guys is the executive no, no, director. No, they're, they're both foundation. They're both but, foundation. But one of them is the executive director. The other is the public executive secretary at the okay, time. Okay, so he's over Div 6, mm -hmm. which is getting new people into the organization. <laughs> yeah, and at the time, I was uh, the tutor of the, uh, the Duggan children, Bob Duggan's kids. Okay. Um, I only did it for like a couple months. That but was when they still lived here in Clearwater? Yeah, I was a tutor. I was just tutoring for Clearwater Academy. And, uh, and then I had just gotten my Eagle Scout. And uh, yeah, I was working at a school. And uh, I wanted to do something big with my life. And at that point, I had like such a fucking crazy idea of like, we, we were all, we were all hardcore about being Scientologists. And, and how, old, how old were you at this point? 18. Okay. I just turned 18. And uh, so after an event, they pull me into the Hibiscus, the restaurant at the Fort Harrison, and they close me, and I say, fine, I'll start. Oh, such a stupid, stupid decision. But they so you're 18, they, they basically signed a two-and-a-half-year contract? Mm hmm Okay. And, they, and then basically they tell me I'm going to be the, the public contact secretary. I'm going to be over Division 6A, right? So where Tom Cummins is over three divisions, I'm going to be over one of them. Right. Well, about day two on staff, I get told that I can't be that position. I have to go pick a different position. So they're showing me all the positions available. This guy named Grant Masonis, right? Real mousy computer nerd, but he's in the public contact division. And he shows me what they do, and they send out tens of thousands of pieces of promo a week. So he's showing me this binder, three-ring binder, of pieces of promo, like what the promo was they sent out, whether it was like a movie ticket to see one of their fantastic blockbuster films on the mind or a personality test or an invite to come in for a lecture, and then how many responses they got. I mean, they would send out 20,000 of these, 50,000. For every like 10,000 things they sent out, they got like one response, maybe two, written back. And usually the response so would be like- So they're checking the response rate on every promo piece? Yeah, but I'm telling you, out of like every week, they would send out like 200,000 pieces of promo and they would get like four responses. And why is he showing this to you? Because he's saying, because he was trying to show me the post. He was trying to get me interested. He was the day public contact secretary, but they're building up the foundation. So they, he's like, take that. And I go, I, I go, so basically you sit up here and do fucking nothing with your life. No, thanks. Right. So I left that and then I get shown some other like FSM activation. I see I'm supposed to get other Scientologists to sell books and do that. I said, that sounds terrible. And so I, I called Tom and I go, dude, you guys spend hours getting me to do this other thing. And I was like the poster child of Scientology by then. They had me on po literally posters. <laughs> I was the poster child of Scientology. And why? Why did they have you on posters? Because I'm fucking handsome as shit. <laughs> I know, but what were the posters? Of me with headphones on. Oh, okay. Re reading a Congress. Just generic to him, and I'm just boy like, on chorus. Yeah, I'm just like stoked piece. out of my mind to be listening to L. Ron Hubbard. Okay. And uh, and then I was in their source mag. I mean, I was like, and I just got my Eagle Scout for the boy, the, the Scientology right. Chartered Boy Scout troop. 
I was like, and I was running their Youth for Human Rights group. I was running their volunteer minister missions to New Orleans, Baton Rouge, Punta Gorda, Pensacola, right? I was doing all this stuff, and I was just, I was pretty much the best person in the world ever, Aaron. <laughs> in the world. Okay, so you, you go from being the best uh, poster child <laughs> in the world to being recruited for staff to being told you can't do the, the bait and switch, yeah. Yeah. and then you call them up and you say, hey, what? What do you say? I say, I, well, so I'm in the org, but there's like five stories, no elevator, you know, and uh, I don't know where Tom is. I call him, I go, hey, man, so I was told I was going to be the public contact secretary, and now I can't do it. I, I, I really kind of don't want to do this. He goes, get the fucking vagina out of your, or get the fucking sand out of your fucking pussy and choose a fucking post just like everyone else. Nick, this is three days after he told me I was like the shit. Right, and then he's like so grateful I was going to be his right hand man, and so I just got, yeah. I got downgraded. I got, I got, I got sent to coach. Yeah, and, uh, uh, something, and so, t- something tells me that the the clergy of the <coughs> Catholic Church does not swear quite as much yeah, as and the so, and so, staff members at Scientology churches. Yeah, and so I went to HCO, Hubbard Communications Office, the Ethics Justice Division, and I was like, I don't want to be here. I was like, Can I just, you know, like I never showed up. Hey, <laughs> I've only been here for two days. Kind of didn't join. Anyway, they pulled the whole spiel, like, we'll take away your friends and family if you try to leave deal. And I was like, in that sense, I'll stay. I'm gonna, <laughs> if you're going to take away my friends and family, this place isn't so bad. I could stay here for two and a half years. In fact, two and a half plus a couple weeks. Who knows? <laughs> All right. So what post did you get put on to? Oh, man. I, I mean, I did everything. I, I, was, I was the worst staff member. They, well, it was the best and worst, right? So what happened was they ended up getting me to start selling books, apparently, right? So I started working at these kiosks okay. and, the, and the fairs, and I'm selling Dianetics books, right? I'm like, ah, oh, whatever. No, I, uh, I felt bad. No one could understand Dianetics. I'd read it three times, and I kind of kind of understood it, but I was like, no one can understand this. I was, I was at University Mall, which University Mall in Tampa off Fowler, if your car stereo got stolen, I could pretty much get it back for you. That's what <laughs> University Mall was. That was its demographic. <laughs> And I was selling, so I was selling a book of fucking <laughs> this verbose shit to people that dropped out of middle school. Right. It was worthless. Anyway, selling I, books on the street. I just, that's a tough job to do at an org. Yeah, and 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 and, and then so that was that started to kind of break me down. But I was good at it, you know. I could sell like twenty books a week, which was about ten times more than most people. Yeah. <coughs> and then I called the CMO people, this girl named Brittany Arnold, really hot chick they had, but CMO is always hot chicks. And they had this other chick. It's funny chick. how that works. They had this other chick, Jillian Seeger. And uh, I remember the, the straw that broke the camel's back. I'd only been on staff a few months. And she called me, I, I, it was my one morning off, because I never had time off. I, I worked Monday through Friday, 8.30 to 5.30 at my job. And then I'd go to staff, I, it was a 40 minute drive on my motorcycle to eat like to these places, actually like an hour drive to Fowler to get over to USF area from mm. the beach where I worked. And um, it was Saturday morning, I remember I got like three hours off. That was my only time during the week, literally. I worked nine to six on the weekends. Right. So I just had this one morning off and Jillian said, come in, you're urgently needed. And I said, for what? I said, I just want to see my, I want to spend time with my girlfriend. She said, Nick, this is command intention, straight from the top. You need to be here. I said, fuck, man, what did I get myself into? So I, I get out of bed. I'm so fucking tired, man. I mean, my schedule had just been beating my ass. I drive there. I go up there. Hi, Jillian. Oh, this is so terrible. I go up there, and she gives me a fucking stack of promo. And I go, what is this? She goes, you need to go pass this out around the neighborhood. That was urgent. And I said, I drove on my one little slot of time off down here to pass out promo? Why don't you do it, Jillian? And she goes, <laughs> I'm way too qualified for that, Nick. Get out there. Don't fucking complain. <laughs> I was like shaking. And... uh I was that morning, I, I realized, I said, they fucking own me. It, it, what, it wasn't even funny. It was like, they literally fucking own me. Right. I was thinking, I've got nothing. They own me. <laughs> so what's interesting is that <clears throat> with you being at Tampa Org, right? So the story you're telling, you've got a Seared member, right? A Commodore's mm-hmm. Messenger. Yeah. And there's a lot of altitude and authority that comes from someone who's in the CMO 
in the Commodore's Messenger's org. That's a much higher stress environment that you were dealing with in the Tampa org uh. than you would find in any other org where there aren't really Sea Org members. There might be one or two in, in most orgs, but they don't have any real authority. They're there just to be kind of the eyes and ears of international management. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so you're in a position where, they, in other words, because the Sea Org had so much attention on Tampa org, they're able to say something to you like not being willing to come in and hand out promo for three hours on your day off. It, refusing not even do, a day off, like morning right, off. Refusing to do that, you know, if you refuse to do that, they could maybe threaten you with declare. Oh, and they would. They they what? used to get me in so much trouble. Right. When, when I when I refused to sell books anymore, right. It was after that that I just I told Brittany. I said, Brittany, I said you need to find someone else to be at the university mall tomorrow to man this kiosk because I'm not going to be here. I'll be at the org. I said you can make me do whatever you want. I won't be here. And she. Can't argue with me. I literally at that point was like, "Fucking declare me." Right. <laughs> I was a tough. But so anyway, I ended up. Uh, they ended up making me clean bathrooms and wash their cars uh, for about two months. And I was like, I'd rather do that than sell this fucking book to people. Right. Right. And I just went around, vacuumed, and I mopped, and I was like, right. well, there you go. At least, at least you weren't being bothered. I went from it. playing classical piano, kickboxing, playing soccer, and running Boy Scouts, getting my Eagle Scout, to having scholarships and all that. So I was a janitor, you know. Right. I was a fucking janitor who didn't want to lose his family. That, right, that's right. that's the evil part, right? Wow. And uh, yeah, man, it sucked. Right. And but anyway, and then and then I ended up going to Ebor, and then I met a guy. And, uh, well, what's in Ebor? Ebor was a testing center, a life improvement center. It's where they do personality tests, IQ tests, and they sell books. And how is, just explain very briefly, how that's different than um, the other place that you didn't they, want to keep going to? Well, the other place, they... they it wasn't a test center? It was just a, a book kiosk? Yeah, it was, it was literally a kiosk. Oh, like, it wasn't a building. Yeah, it was like a kiosk that they sell cell phone covers at. Like that, that kind of kiosk. Like okay. It was in a mall. So Ebor is a full-blown um, a building, a test center. It's built out. Okay, I get what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. And then so, and then, but... This dude, he uh, convinced me to, he actually offered me money <laughs> to, to A come. staff member? Yeah. Okay. He's like, he's like, I'll give you 10 grand to come do this. Seriously? Yeah. Matt. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. And, uh. Because it was his job and he wanted help doing it, it? He wanted out, man. Right. And I was 18 and I was like 10 grand. I'll do it. I was like, this job, fuck, I've been cleaning toilets. So, so. to clarify, yeah, we, we won't get into who Matt is right now, but this is a staff member who is rich. He's basically offering you 10 grand out of his own pocket to come help. He hated his, his job load. so much. No, not to ease his load. Him. Not ease his load. Yeah, he to cover out. for him. Yeah. Okay. But, but he sold it to me. I think I would have done it without the money because he sold it to me because he, he said, you keep. You don't have to deal with all those idiots at the fucking org and have them ride your ass because those guys are weird. When you're at the org, they just look for problems. I remember the this guy named Dane Fiore just came up to me and was like, "Hey Nick, are you masturbating?" <laughs> you're like, "Do you mean right now?" Oh no, my god! Do you mean ten minutes? I'm ago? like, no, I got a few minutes left. <laughs> I was like, "I'm not due for like another another ten or so." But uh, no, and I said, "Why?" He goes. Well, just answer. Are you, are you masturbating? I go, dang, I, I got to be honest. I got a pretty good relationship with myself, and I'm not really ready to make that relationship public. <laughs> he made me read all the... All what was he, the ethics officer? Yeah. Oh, I forgot. He's okay. been a Scientologist for like a year and a half. Okay. But he was like a black belt, so he, he, he took all that energy and put it into the jerk-off police. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay, so you go to Ebor. And, no, and, and, so anyway, I would, I'm just giving you an example. I hated being at the org. Like, right. they were so fucking weird. Right, and right, then the, right, the right. weekly staff meetings it like, felt like, like AA meetings. Like, people would stand up and go, today, I helped someone with their headaches. And everyone would go, to LRH. And then I would sit there like, what the fuck did I give up my life for, for this? And uh, so he, he sells me on the fact that you can get away from all those people. And I go, you know what? Sold. And I, and I just, I, I, I called Brittany Arnold and I said, put me in Ebor. She goes, you think I can just put you in Ebor? I go, yeah. I was like, you need people there. I go, you don't need people to keep fucking vacuuming your floors. You're just doing that to break my spirits. Mission accomplished. <clears throat> Little did I know, I'm like, sea biscuit. They thought they were winning, but then I came back with a motherfucking vengeance. Going clear, came out. The rest is history. I'm uh, awesome. Uh, so she puts you in Ebor. <coughs> yeah. And how long have you been on staff at this point? 
Five months. Oh, just a short amount of time. About six months. Okay, so you go to Ebor. What uh, was it better than the kiosk? Does it go south? What happens? It was better because there was like hot chicks. I didn't have to look like I was in a cult all the time. Like right. I, I didn't have to. I, I could wear jeans and like a polo or a t-shirt. Like I could hide from my scene, like the my bosses, my seniors, and uh, I could hang out in the shops. Like I started making friends with people, the tattoo artists, and. The, the like hookah bar owners, the club owners and stuff. Matt knew a lot of people. So I got, you know, I was like, this is okay. I could kind of get into this. Matt was teaching me a lot about business and, you know, teaching me a lot about people and how to sell. He was a really, really amazing salesperson. He obviously got my dumb ass to come do this <laughs> miserable job with him. Did he pay you? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, and I, so I, no, I ended up. I, I mean, I I ended up realizing he wasn't going to pay me, so I got him to teach me a lot about sales yeah. and business. So he, how he, he ended up hooking me up with a lot of work, though. He he ended up getting me out of the church eventually. So right, right. I think it came full circle. True. So how long does that go on for before it goes south, and how long before you you leave staff? Or well, so now the next two years are just they're miserable. I'm a great body router, though, right? I'm a, a recruiter. I bring in about 4,000 people. So body routing is literally taking someone off the street, having a short conversation with them, and walking them into the org. Yeah. Okay. And then I, I, I got about 4,000 people to come in. So you're walking them into the test center in Ebor, or you're actually putting them in a van and taking them to the org? No, no, no. Walking them to the test center. Okay. Yeah. Um, it was a couple blocks. Okay. And uh, so I was really good at it. And, uh, and I'd sell them books sometimes. and. And so how many? What, what, were, the, what were the numbers that you said? <laughs> about 4,000 people in. Over what period of time? Well, the amount of time I body routed was probably like a year and a few months, right? Okay. Because I threatened to leave Scientology probably six times while I was on staff. And every time, because I hate it. I, hate I mean, it. leave staff or leave Scientology? Well, first leave staff. But see, they, they'd always do this run around. You can't just leave staff. If you leave staff, you get declared a suppressive person. And Lynn Irons, the couple times I tried, like, like the four times I tried to leave staff, would always have these conversations with me and go, right. we'll take away your friends and family. And I would go, I'm going to go back to post. I'm going to do my thing. Lynn, you're a good motivational speaker. Thank you for reminding me what I lose <laughs> if I don't. Thor thoroughly love sucking your dick. So. <laughs> Like, that's pretty much how that went. And so eventually I was like, so trying to leave staff doesn't work. I'm going to leave Scientology. So I would call Ed Clark, who was actually one of the scout leaders in my Boy Scout troop. And he was now like the uh, H has, the HAS, Hubbard Area Secretary, which is over the Justice Department. And uh, so I called him and I said, I want to leave Scientology. And he goes, Nick, is this becoming of an Eagle Scout? And I was like, yep. Like, I didn't remember that conversation vividly. I was like, yes, it is. He goes, are you keeping the scout honor in mind? And I thought about it. Yes. <laughs> I want it out of there so bad. And he goes, okay, come see me. So he gives me this, like, five-hour speech of why I should stay on staff. So he's the leader of the Scientology Boy Scout troop. Well, he was the assistant scout master at the, when I was in scouts before I got my Eagle Scout. But then he stopped being in scouts, and he was on staff now. Ah. Yeah. He tried to talk me into staff, but then I found out, I saw on a, on a computer when I was leaving staff, that he was also trying to leave staff because he was on the list of people that needed to he leave. He was trying to convince you not to leave while he himself was in the process of leaving. Yeah. And if he could convince you to stay, that would make up the damage for his own leaving. Yeah. See, Ed Clark. Funny how that works. You're not an Eagle Scout, so you don't know what integrity is. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay, so do you finish your contract? Do you finish <coughs> the two and a half years? So I do, right? Like, yeah. I I, uh, I finished my contract after doing all this bullshit and all this craziness that happened on staff, and uh, but there was there's one other really crazy thing that happened on staff that really opened my eyes. I mean, they treat you like terribly. They they talk down to you. It's fuck you, you out ethics off the rail piece of shit. If, if they don't like the way you're dressed, if I dressed like this, it was like. It didn't matter if I bought if I brought in a hundred people that day. When the next closest person that could body route to me could bring in maybe four people. In fact, Chris Kajeltson and Lauren Wagner and this guy named uh, Nolan Wright all took over after me. And I think their combined total body routed over the next three years that they were on staff was like two hundred people, hmm. three people, you know. And that's that was like me and my in 
in a good two weeks for me. What right. they did in like three years, I did in two weeks. Right. But it didn't matter how much I produced. They just, they hated me. They yeah. wanted, they, 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 they're such a vitriolic, hateful, spiteful group. And you just, you feel like a terrible person. I mean, they, they would keep, they would make me work extra on my birthday, you know, D to discuss book wrapping. Right. Like when they knew very well that I had specifically requested just to be able to get off on time, not to get off early, please let me off on time on this night. Right. So I can please go see my girlfriend. She's making me dinner. Like, and they would curse me out and keep me there and threaten to take away my fucking right. family if I didn't. All right, good.